Is Tim here? I didn't see him. Where? I wanted to give uh, Tim. Thanks for having us, man. Tim McClellan. If you don't know Tim, he's an, an, a Jersey Shore, a New Jersey icon, and among other things, this is his place. Thank you for hosting us. And it's a particular point to make on December 21st that he is the brains and founder and still central actor in Holiday Express, which does extraordinary work around, in particular, the Jersey Shore, raising money for folks who otherwise wouldn't have Christmas without Tim and his colleagues. So thank you, Tim. <laughs> You can leave. <laughs> We're done. So, greetings from the Jersey Shore. What a day, huh? Five, uh, five years ago and a little, Hurricane Sandy opened all of our eyes to the realities and threats of climate change. In one day, lifetimes of memories and future dreams were blown down and washed away. But some places, like Pier Village here, this little community in Long Branch, remain standing because they were built to a higher standard to be resilient in the face of stronger and more frequent storms. Resiliency, many learned, isn't just a personal character trait, and climate change isn't a myth. They are issues that New Jersey must focus on in very real terms as we face a future when the question about another Sandy isn't answered with the word if, but with the word when. The leadership needed to respond to that answer has been lacking for the past eight years. From unilaterally pulling out of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, abolishing DEP's Office on Climate Change, and letting polluters off the hook for the damages they've done, New Jersey's environmental leadership has been severely eroded. The state that was once a sterling example for strong and common sense environmental protection has become just another practitioner of the failed premise that you can have either clean air and clean water or a strong economy, but not both. It's high time we restored this balance and once again make policy based on scientific fact and not on politics. In seeking the person to serve as commissioner, I and we, and I always say we because Sheila Oliver, our lieutenant governor-elect, is with us in spirit, wanted, we wanted someone who understands fully the threats that we face, who is tough on polluters, who is understanding of those living in environmentally sensitive areas, and who recognizes that our twin goals of a resilient and responsible future and a strong and fair economy are not mutually exclusive. Today, I am incredibly pleased to introduce Catherine McCabe as New Jersey's next Commissioner of Environmental Protection. She is joined today by her husband, Kevin, daughter, Kara, son, Patrick, it's an honor to have you here today. I know your daughter, Sheila, and her husband, Raj, wanted to be here but couldn't be, so we give them a shout-out in absentia. And for you all, public service is a team sport, as it is for us. I'm honored that my wife, Tammy, and son, Sam, are with us today. Catherine has been recognized throughout her career as a strong advocate and leader. She holds both her degree in environmental science and her Juris Doctor from Columbia University. She has served, and this is a long list, as Assistant New York Attorney General and as the Deputy Chief of the Environmental Enforcement Section of the Federal Department of Justice. She has been Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Office of Enforcement and Compliance Assurance at the Federal Environmental Protection Agency and served as one of three judges on EPA's Court of Appeals. She has served as both deputy and acting regional administrator of EPA's Region 2 and as acting administrator of the EPA itself. I also must note that Catherine worked at the EPA alongside our dear friend Lisa Jackson, 
who served our state so ably as Commissioner of Environmental Protection not so long ago. I don't want to put words in Lisa's mouth or Gina McCarthy's mouth, but the words that I think they will utter on their own are extraordinarily positive about Catherine. Now we will ask Catherine to step up and reassert New Jersey's leadership on the national and global stages. We need solutions rooted in science and fact-based analysis. We need to look at good models in other states and in other countries so that we can make our own residents safer and their communities stronger. We need to reestablish the links to critical thinking that we need to make sound decisions. We need a commissioner committed to growing our green energy economy. I remain and we remain committed to a new energy master plan, one that we have not had for a long time in this state, that would see our state achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2050 with, importantly, achievable shorter-term benchmarks. I guess if your ultimate term is 33 years, anything is shorter term. Uh, so we've talked in particular about offshore wind and having uh, thousands of megawatts uh, by the year 2030 as an example. I am, op uh, I am as optimistic as ever at the prospects, as I said, of offshore wind power and for rejuvenating our solar energy market through innovative ways for more communities to tap into the power of the sun. We need a commissioner who will work with advocates not just in our suburban and rural areas, but in our cities, where clean air and water are too often at a premium. We must end the thinking that environmental protection is only about open spaces and babbling brooks, which it is, by the way, but it is also about environmental justice in reducing emissions, for example, at our ports to combat high rates of asthma among urban youth and eliminating lead from our water, among other important steps. We need a commissioner who will not let polluters walk away from the damages they've done. Like you, like we all, I suspect, I was dumbfounded at how this administration wrote off a multi-billion dollar settlement, settlement for mere pennies on the dollar. And we need a commissioner who will work with communities and businesses to get answers to questions more quickly and more definitively. Let's be very clear. Strong environmental protection and good economic planning and development can and must go hand in hand. It is up to us to work to create better, more sustainable projects that both respect our environment and grow our economy. And we need to do both urgently. On all of these and more, I know and we know Catherine is up to the challenges we face. This is a beautiful state from the shore to the Delaware River, from the Pine Barrens to Stokes State Forest, and everywhere in between. We have a responsibility to grow our state responsibly, to protect our natural resources, and ensure a more resilient New Jersey that will be strong and prosperous in the face of a changing climate. It is now my extraordinary pleasure to introduce to you our next commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, Catherine McCabe. Well, thank you, Governor-elect, for your inspiring words and for the trust and the confidence that you have placed in me to lead the important work of protecting public health and the environment for the people of New Jersey. I look forward to working with all of you and working with the governor-elect and his team, if confirmed, and to meeting with and gaining the confidence of the members of the state senate who must approve this nomination. I also want to thank and recognize the members of my family who are joining me today, my husband Kevin, daughter Kara, and son Patrick. I could not do this important work without their support and encouragement, which they have given enthusiastically and without reservation. So thank you for your support and for being here with me today. It would be the honor and the privilege of my life to lead the dedicated women and men of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection in the work that they do every day to make the air that New Jerseyans breathe clean, to give us clean water to drink, and safe and healthy places to live and work. 
New Jersey was an early and progressive leader in environmental protection, leading the way, for example, in tackling the legacy of contaminated Superfund and other sites that are left over in too many places from our industrial past. The governor-elect is right. It is time for New Jersey to lead again. Climate change is clearly happening, even here, at this beautiful and calm, for the moment, Jersey Shore. But in recent years, we have seen firsthand the increasing frequency and violence of coastal storms and flooding, most notably from Superstorm Sandy. And I remember vividly my husband digging out the five feet of sand that landed in the yard of our home in Ocean City. In my current job as the Deputy Regional Administrator of EPA, I have been working for years with other federal and state partners as we continue our long, too long recovery from Sandy to rebuild and increase the resilience of our coastal communities. But in the past few months, I've been working nonstop to assist Puerto Rico and the people in the U.S. Virgin Islands as they struggle to recover from the very devastating impacts there of Hurricanes Irma and Maria. And I've personally witnessed just how devastating the effects of these storms can be on our communities. We have no more time to waste. Now is the time to take action, both to help lead the way in helping to slow climate change and adapting to make our communities more resilient. I look forward to working with the governor-elect and the rest of his team, the legislature, the people of New Jersey to address this challenge and the many other important environmental challenges that we face in New Jersey. As Governor-elect Murphy described, I've dedicated my career to public service and specifically to environmental protection. My interest came originally from a love of the beautiful places that I had the privilege to grow up and live in, uh, from the mountains in Hudson River Valley in upstate New York, where I came from, uh, to the beautiful shores of New Jersey, down a little farther, where I have uh, spent most of my adult summers in my husband's longtime family home in Ocean City. My children and I have come to love and treasure that home and the Jersey Shore as much as he does. So over a long career in federal service, I found great satisfaction in rising to the challenges of cleaning up some of the country's worst environmental messes, Superfund sites, drinking water contamination, toxic air pollution, and overflowing urban sewers, to name a few. And yes, we do have all of those here in New Jersey. But perhaps what motivates me most of all to take on this new challenge is my children and your children. The Indian tribes of New York have a saying that we do not own the land and the waters, that we hold them in trust for the next seven generations. I take that trust responsibility very seriously. And finally, I'd like to share with you some of the key principles that would guide my work as New Jersey's DEP commissioner, if confirmed. There are five. First, dedication to the fundamental duty to protect public health and the environment that our people and our communities depend on. Second, the essential principles of following the best science and the law. Three, very importantly, open and active listening to all communities and all sectors of our economy that are affected by the department's work. Fourth, like the governor, I strongly believe that environmental protection and, environment and economic vitality go hand in hand. We do not have to choose between the two. And lastly, I am committed to the principle of balanced and transparent decision making. I recognize that there are often no easy answers and, and no quick solutions to many of our most pressing environmental challenges. Getting the solutions right requires smart, hard work and innovation. But it also often requires trade-offs and compromises that must be fully aired and debated and balanced to find our best way forward. My commitment to you, the people of New Jersey, and to the governor-elect is to be as open and transparent in that process as possible. Like the governor-elect, I recognize how important it is to talk and engage directly with the people of the communities we represent and serve. And if confirmed, I look forward to being a member of a hands-on administration that takes public engagement and the voices of the people of the state of New Jersey seriously. So thank you again, Phil for the honor of this nomination, and thank you to all of you who have come to join us here today. Well done.
Tim, we don't want to overstay our welcome. We might take a couple of questions, but just to, fra <laughs> just to frame that, uh, you, you said the calm Jersey Shore. I've been up in this, uh, I've been up on this level, and it won't be calm tonight, I'm sure. Um, a couple of uh, just a, uh, ar uh, overarching comments. Um, most importantly, um, I don't think this is a you know in the awful um, fallout. I'll say this. Uh, as a point of personal privilege, is the awful fallout of Donald Trump getting elected president. If you're looking for silver linings, uh, had he not gotten elected, we wouldn't have been able to get near Catherine. Uh, so we, we wake up every day trying to figure out how can we see that glass is half full and not half empty. On this day, we wake up saying, you know what, how blessed are we to have someone of this talent and experience available to work in our administration. It's an extraordinary honor and treat for us. Um, th th before you go, one other uh, health warning. Uh, we will not be announcing anyone tomorrow, so you, you just want to make sure you know that. Uh, we've been on, we've been on a, a fairly rapid pace here. Uh, and, but we might be um, coming up with some meaningful announcements over the course of the next 10 days, uh, including over the holidays. Uh, I think I'll defer to Dan uh, and team or Jose, but I think if we do, they are almost certainly going to be things that are done on paper by press release as opposed to two events, is that fair to say? Um, and so we're, uh, just to give you a sense, a couple of quick questions. Let me go to some folks that have been able to, uh, I've been calling on you every time, so I'm just gonna break the chance. Who's call back here? Thank you very much, Governor-elect I'm not ignoring you. Yesterday, Governor Christie proposed the legislator should ch legislature should change the law to make property taxes a full deduction on the New Jersey state return to make up for the change in federal law. But do you support this, and if so, I always got to be careful of the person who's reading that, like just like that, so faithfully. <laughs> Listen, we uh, have said, and I mean it now that this thing is passed, um, everything has to be on the table. That's not a, by, by, by a long shot, not a crazy idea. Some ideas out there are crazy and really disturbing, uh, but that's one that is, needs to be on the list to look at. I haven't thought about whether it's now or later it, it should get looked at. But I would say this, if it's such a good idea, we're in the bottom of the ninth with two outs, two strikes, nobody on base. So this might have been a good idea to be talking about over the past several years as opposed to a rush to judgment uh, over the next uh, few days. But, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's uh, not a crazy idea. We need to have everything on the table. I mentioned this yesterday uh, in Secaucus, whether it's uh, our legal uh, options, questioning constitutionality, our creative juices, working with other states, reassessing and re, um, uh, reviewing our, the notion of how we're taxed and how people pay for things in the state and how those are classified, all of that has to be on the table and then some. Brian. Ambassador, um, as far as windmills are concerned, there has been some enabling legislation passed years ago that was never acted upon. When would you expect or hope or like to see the construction of windmills well, I don't have a good answer on the when, on, in particular, on the construction, but we want to get at this quickly. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't want to let you down by giving you a squishy answer, but it's a high priority. Catherine and I have talked about this. We've got sort of a in the range of a 3,500 megawatt aspiration, 13, about to be 12 years from now, uh, which means you can't get there if you don't start that pretty quickly. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a huge lost opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. Not to beat a drum that we've beaten before, right. but. It, we have among the most unique positions, not just in the shore respect and the miles of shore, but uh, the wind that, that blows off our shore. We can be the California of the East Coast if we choose to be. Uh, someone said, I, I can't remember if I said this to Catherine or not, someone when I said that recently said, uh, why don't you tell California they could be the New Jersey of the West Coast, by the way. <laughs> uh, and, and furthermore, and again, I don't want to beat the same drum, so I don't have a specific answer on when, but soon. Uh, but we also, if we're going to have a wind farm that size, we've talked about going to manufacturers and saying, you're not only going to inst install them here, you ought to be building them here. I don't know if you want to yeah. add anything on wind. We have been looking out, my husband and my children and I, for years at that horizon that we're looking at here and saying, when are the windmills coming? Clearly, this has got to be New Jersey's future. And this is an opportunity we've been waiting for for too long. So let's get at it. Yeah. And by the way, it's, it, it's one of these one plus one equals three shots as well because it's, 
really good, high-paying union jobs, which is great. Ma'am. Yeah, well, I, I, it's a similar uh, question, and, and my answer will be similar as well, which is it's not a crazy idea. Again, we've got to have everything on the table. We're being assaulted uh, by Washington and by this tax bill. So if we can't sit on our hands. We cannot sit idly by. So whether it's through the attorney general, whether it's reviewing the nature of how we're taxed and pay for things in this state, uh, whether it's creative juices, whether it's working with other states, questioning constitutionality, all of this is on the table. Um, again, I'm a little bit, uh, a little bit come on on the stuff that comes in at the bottom of the ninth inning with two outs, two strikes, and nobody on. I'd like to think that we can have a fulsome review of this, but we're not going to stand back and stand idly. Uh, we are a, we're being assaulted, and we, we, we intend to, and we will assert ourselves in all of the avenues I just talked about, and maybe some more. A couple real quick ones. Yeah. Well, there's lots of choices um, for that. So um, obviously climate change, it's uh, over, over uh, time for us to start taking some action on that and, and to building up the shore resiliency. There have been a lot of efforts. Um, the federal government's been part of that as well as the state, but we haven't done enough and we haven't done it fast enough and we haven't got all the people back in their homes yet. So that's something we need to pay attention to. Um, the water infrastructure of the state uh, needs attention. Uh, we have uh, some beautiful rivers and streams in New Jersey and the beautiful bays and the, and the waters that we all like to uh, bathe in in the, in the summertime um, have uh, see too much pollution. Um, and that's largely because of the state of our, our sewers. Um, we're doing a pretty good job. We've made a lot of progress. We're doing a lot better these days, but we've got a long way to go. And then lastly, I would uh, point it at air pollution in particular. It's not something that we tend to notice as much on a day-to-day -day basis as, say, the people in Beijing do uh, these days. But we still have pockets um, of really disproportionate effects of air pollution, um, particularly around the port areas and, and um, areas that where we have our most vulnerable populations, whether it's because of the concentration of the deep <coughs> truck traffic or, or anything else. So there, there are just lots of um, issues with the air pollution and water pollution that give us a full plate of things to address. I'm going to ask you one more here. You had one or not? Uh, actually, Mike. You got it. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Last question. I want to ask about the timelines, pipelines. There's been a lot of hubbub about the two is that something you administrate would review uh, as DEP commissioner? Is that something you'd encourage that is the hard look to take on these permits? I don't want to speak for Catherine, but the, the thing on the pylons that we've been particularly critical of is governance uh, and who's on the commission and who's making the decisions. Uh, I think Catherine said it better than I could. Uh, we want to be transparent, fair, balanced, consider all sides, whether that's the environmental mm -hmm. issues, whether it's the business or economic interests, whether it's the labor interests. Um, one of the things that it has attracted me to Catherine is she is uh, the ultimate umpire and calls balls and strikes. But let's make sure the umpire isn't in the tank for one of the teams. Okay. Um, no, the umpire likes to be well informed. Exactly. First I got to cut you off, David, but I'll come back to you. But I want to say this: we got to go. Uh, we wish you happy holidays. Um, I want to say the following: uh, that Catherine is the seventh cabinet member uh, that we have announced one of whom, Sheila Oliver, is the DCA commissioner, is not subject to um, Senate confirmation in her capacity as lieutenant governor. Uh, the other six are, and we don't take that confirmation presumptively, so we will work uh, together. I know Catherine feels that way, and that she said it. Um, but uh, Grabeer Graywall uh, has been nominated just to review as attorney general, Liz Moyo as treasurer, Tahisha Way as uh, secretary of state, Marlene Curide as the Commissioner of Division of uh, Banking uh, and Insurance. Diane uh, gutierrez Gacchetti yesterday as Commissioner of the Department of Transportation, and today, Catherine uh, McCabe for uh, DEP. Uh, I will say on behalf of the team, I want to give big shout outs to Jose Lozano and Matt Placken and Dan Bryan and other colleagues both here and not here, Pete Camerano, most importantly, Stephanie Lagos, folks who are trying to make this happen. Uh, we're particularly proud of that, of, of this extraordinary group of folks. We're particularly proud because we said also that we intended to put a team on the field that was as diverse as this state. 
Um, and we are the most diverse state in the nation, and I would say I'm not patting myself or ourselves on the back, but so far, so good. Um, I'm also proud, I believe, that we have, as of today, set the all-time New Jersey record for nominations for cabinet positions uh, between Election Day and at this point in December. We're not necessarily done, uh, but uh, we're incredibly proud of an extraordinary team uh, who have nominated and put forth. We wish you all great holidays and great New Year's. Take care, folks.